Hey, Cherie, how's it going there today? Okay, day despite this oh. pandemic? Oh, yeah, it's great. Just doing a little bit of uh, my son has moved home. He lost his house in the Woosley Fire, and he finally has come home to where moving him around and stuff, you know, doing stuff that you need to do in the house. Exactly, exactly. And I bet Ken has you pretty busy with interviews as well. Yes. How's everything going with you? It is nonstop, but in the best of ways possible, given the circumstances. Positive disposition goes pretty far, to say the least, but it's great to have new music from you, I must say. Oh, thank you, Darren. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I really like this record. And did you know that outright Matt was going to produce it? I had the pleasure of interviewing him a couple of days ago, and it sounded like it was something that he talked you into, but at the same time, you weren't going to do an album. Well, you know what? Uh, I just didn't think it was going to happen. I mean, he was the one that really came up with the whole idea. Matt is, I mean, this guy's a go-getter. You know, he is a pro all the way. And after we opened for Joan, that night somebody approached him and said, I want to make a record with her. And, uh, of course, we ended up going with with Kenny and, and Blackheart. But um, he said, I want to do this record. We're going to do a record. We are going to do a record, Cherie. And I was like, really? You know, I, mean, it all just, I, I was thrilled at the whole prospect of it. Did I expect it? Did I expect all these great people? Absolutely not. But that's what Matt, Matt makes those things happen. When did you first meet Matt? Did you know him for decades or anything like that? I had met him. Um, at some social things, you know, fundraisers, stuff like that. And, um, he had reached out to me to do some singing on his now wife's record, but I was in the middle of doing all the promo for the runaways film. So by the time I got back to him, uh, that was already a done deal. And then I told him that, that I had been offered, uh, you know, to open for Joan at the Pacific Amphitheater. And I said, I really need to put a band together. I need to find a drummer. Do you know anyone? And he goes, I'll drum for you. And I swear I fell over. It's like, what? <laughs> and he goes, and I'll put together a band for you, too. I, I, I'm so indebted to him. He put it, it, That's how I met Nick Mayberry and Grant Fitzpatrick, and I brought my son Jake on board, and it was just a killer band. And that's the band that went into the studio as well, and we toured together, minus Matt, of course. He's, he's a busy guy, but, yeah, Matt made all this happen. It's it just like in a blink of an eye. It was shocking. And do you have plans to tour behind this album once the smoke clears with all the pandemic? I think I would have to. Uh, I love these songs. I love the high energy of the of these tunes. And, of course, you know, I always love doing runaway songs, and they would fit right in. So I'm hoping that that happens. When I go through your discography... It amazes me that you've been able to work with so many artists that people stereotype as being difficult, yet you seem to get along with everybody. Has that always been the case? Yeah, it actually has. I I mean, I, I'm just very appreciative of people's time. And, um, you know, I, 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 I tip my hat to anybody that's in this business. And uh, I think because I started so young, I really... You know, I've seen people just become real, excuse my expression, assholes in this business uh, with fame and all that kind of stuff. And and so, you know, I just never allowed that even in my life. So, you know, I, I give people the compliments that they deserve, and it always comes from the heart. And, uh, you know, that's that's kind of like what I do. But if I, but if, if if you're not somebody that's a nice person, trust me, that that's not good either. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, I I um, honestly am very blunt and to the point with some. If I think that that they're not being true true to themselves or true for their fans, you know, I I have no problem voicing my opinion about that. And you went from one difficult industry to another by really breaking out as an actress in the '80s. Is acting something you're still interested in? You know what? I do it so rarely. And when I do do it, it's fun. Uh, it was never, hmm, 
I, I didn't like the cattle calls. I mean, when I when I got foxes, it was such a fluke because I was up against, you know, Rosanna Arquette and Christy McNichol and a bunch of other really talented actors. I, I didn't expect to get that part by any means because I didn't. Annie and foxes was a buxom, curly, red-haired, full-lipped girl that I didn't look like her. But uh, somehow, I guess, the writer and the director, Adrian Lyon and, and Joel Blasberg, the producer, just and David Putnam, thought that I was Annie. So I'm so blessed because she was really me. <laughs> but there was no acting involved. Right, and your acting credits does include several episodes of Matlock. Is that something you're proud of? You know, it was just fun. I just had my son... And to be able to go out and and work with Andy Griffith and, you know, it was fun. You know, acting to me, hmm, I mean, you, you really have to develop a taste for it. Either you're meant to do it or you're not. I can pull it off, but is it something that I had to dive into uh, and that I needed? Absolutely not. I mentioned Matlock specifically because that show kind of went from being legendary to a punchline to a pop culture staple that it remains all these decades later. So when you go through your discography or your filmography, it really does stick out in a kind of way to say, well, she was on Matlock. She must have had a good career in acting. Well, I was also on Divorce Court, too. Ha ha. I mean, that was a joke, you know. Um, and I played the girl with no mouth and I had no speaking line. So, you know what the thing is, is that I just, I kind of lived in the moment with all that stuff and and uh again it was really fun to do that show so you know it's it's an experience and, and when you turn things down you're turning down the experience in my opinion why you know i i like to challenge myself and um acting i've always been a whole lot more afraid of I can walk on stage in front of thousands of people. It doesn't bother me at all. Acting, that I do get that, that tinge in my stomach, that little bit of butterfly fear. So uh, even with a chainsaw, you know, I mean, I can handle a chainsaw a lot easier, that death-defying career than uh, acting. But you know what? Who knows? If, if somebody wants me to do something, I'll, I'll definitely do it. And the story of your album was that it was unfortunately delayed due to an accident related to the chainsaw art. Are you back on track with the chainsaw art career? Do you still have a gallery? You know what? I closed that gallery when we were in pre-production for the Runaways movie because a lot of fans were showing up with albums for me to sign and memorabilia and stuff. And, and there was one time that I was carving and I was in the zone, and someone just tapped me on the shoulder, right. which just literally scared the bejesus out of me. And I really realized that I can't have that. I just can't because I have to focus. I can't lose my focus or I'm going to get hurt. Or I'm going to make a mistake, you know, that I can't fix. Because once you take it off, it can't be put back on again. So I closed the gallery down, and I built a place here next to my house. And... uh and so I've been carving here ever since 2009. And does anyone else in your family have the passion for chainsaw art? No. <laughs> in fact, my, my family tried to stop me, especially my brother. He goes, Cherie, I forbid you to do this. I said, Don, uh, who is my younger brother, I said, this is a calling. This, I am going to do this. I can't help it. I have to. You know, that, that inner voice that drives you, that is what I followed because uh, never in my wildest dreams did I ever see myself as a chainsaw artist, ever. But um, it found me, so, and it's been very good to me for the last 20 years. I've read that Jesse James Dupree has a chainsaw endorsement because he's used it as a musical instrument on stage. Do you have endorsements on that end? I've always been in, well, actually, I'm endorsed by Echo, and that, that started probably about 18 years ago, because I had bought an Echo chainsaw, but the carburetor kept going, and so I replaced the, the carburetor twice, 
And then I had to go shoot a monster garage with legendary carver Bob King. And I was using my Makita electric. And Bob was saying, what? Of course, Echo was there. They were there at the shoot because they endorsed Bob. And they said, why are you using this? I said, oh, I've got one of your Echo saws at home. (laughs) And I said, and when I go home, I'm going to take it and I'm going to throw it in the street. Because it's a lemon, and it's never worked for me. And they said, we're going to have to fix that, and which they did. They had me take it to uh, a local store up here. They set me up with a few brand-new saws, and they endorsed me from that moment on. So for about 18 years now, I've been endorsed by Echo. Wow. So between music, the chainsaw art, it sounds like you're creatively fulfilled all the time. I do have a lot a lot of different avenues and I'm and also getting ready to do the audio version of my book, which, uh, is going to be a, a trip for me because that's, you know, we live, I mean, I wrote it twice. I wrote it with Neil Schusterman in 1989, which was a young adult version. And Neil Schusterman is just a brilliant writer. He did the majority of it you know, basically through interviews. And there was one, the green limousine that I basically wrote on my own. And then when I did the adult version of it for when the movie came out, it was hard. I mean, it wasn't hard, but of course you have to relive that stuff and, and tell the stories I couldn't tell in the young adult book. And now that I have to, you know, every word has to be exactly like that book. And, and I have to, and I guess in a way, relive it in real time, um, which is something that is going to be a learning experience, especially the kidnapping and the, the, you know, the rape and all that stuff that I had to go through. I don't know exactly how I'm going to handle that, except I'm going to have to relive it. So these are like little things that I have to do that are a first for me. I like first. Never a dull moment with you, it sounds like. No, actually, there isn't. No. (laughs) Well, on that note, uh, in closing, Shuri, any last words for the kids? Listen to that inner voice. Don't ever ask anybody their opinion, because their path is not your path. Trust your instincts and and only one person can walk your path, and it's you. So please don't think you can take these people with you. Believe in yourself. Believe in that inner voice. And I guarantee you, you will succeed. Absolutely. Outro cast. <laughs>